morning, church. My name is Nat Stein, and I'll be leading us in worship today. We've had about four months of this coronavirus, and I would love to know, from a show of hands, how many of you have yet to get a haircut? Yeah? I've had two, actually, so I can't raise my hand. If I didn't, though, my hair would be out to here. i got this curly hair. Anyway, we're not here to talk about hair, are we? We're here to talk about the love of God, the faithful love of God. Listen to these first two verses from Psalm 107. It says, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His faithful love endures forever. Has the Lord redeemed you? Then speak out. Tell others he has redeemed you from your enemies. That's why we exist as the Church of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're here to do today, to testify to one another and to testify to the world of the goodness, the faithfulness, the love of God through Christ. So let's sing that. This is a song called Grateful, and it simply expresses our gratitude to God for all he is and all he has done. Let's sing. One, two, three. So 
to the one in my praise this morning. first two verses of Psalm 107. This is the last verse of Psalm 107, verse 43. It says, those who are wise will take all this to heart. And you can read the rest of the psalm if you would like to. They will see in our history the faithful love of the Lord. Hopefully you don't have to put that much effort into looking back over the last few days or weeks or months or years and see, you can see the faithful hand of God in your life or in the lives of those around you and that you've had a front row seat to God's love in action. Oh, that's my hope for you. That's my hope that we can continue to see him and be his hands and feet as the church of Jesus Christ, be his love in action. But this is a song praising him, praising God for who he is, praising Christ for his work on the cross and the new life that we have in him. Oh, praise the name. Let's sing. One, two, three. I cast my mind to Calvary, where Jesus
because we were good. Romans chapter 5 says it's while we were still sinners that Christ died for us. Let's pray and thank him for that. Lord, I'm grateful that my salvation and that your love for me does not depend on my goodness because <laughs> I would fail miserably. I do fail miserably every day. And I pray that we can know your love more and more each day. And in turn, return that love to you in worship and spread that love to the world in mission. May we do that, Lord. We love you, we thank you, and we praise your name today in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, Bright City Church. We are so glad that you are here worshiping with us this morning. My name is Ike Miller. I'm one of the pastors here. And if you're new with us, we are so glad that you are tuning in. Uh, we would love to know that you are there. And so one of the ways that you can do that, one of the easiest ways for you to do that is for you to text us. You can text us at Bright City at 94000, and we would love to follow up with you and let you know more about our church and how you can get involved. We'd also love to send you a gift. Uh, we are sending anyone that uh, connects with us uh, a small gift, an Amazon gift card, and so we'd love to send that your way if you'd reach out to us. But I would just personally love the opportunity to get to know you and to meet you and uh, maybe do a Zoom meeting or something like that. So let us know that you are there. We're going to continue our worship now through giving, and there's a couple of ways for you to do that. You can give online at brightcitychurch.com slash give, or you can text brightcity to 77977. 
We believe that giving is just one of the ways that we demonstrate our trust in God, that God is going to provide even when it seems like there's not enough, that he is going to come through, that he is abundant and gracious and good to us. And so we want to invite you to uh, contribute to what God is doing through Bright City right now in our city and in this time. Got a few announcements for you. Uh, The first is we have a couple of more Rooted groups started. Rooted, if you're new here or don't know what Rooted is, Rooted is a 10-week study. And if you're looking for a way to grow in your faith, or maybe you're new to faith and you want to learn what it means to follow Jesus, or maybe you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, but you're looking for something that just reminds you and teaches you some of the essentials of the faith, we would love for you to take the step and join one of our Rooted groups. We've got a men's group and a women's group that will be beginning uh, sometime in July and August, and so we'd love for you to get connected in one of those groups. That's also the best way for you to connect with our community right now and to build relationships. If you would like to get in a Rooted group, you can email us at smallgroups at brightcitychurch.com. Also, uh, we uh, share and shared with us last week during the message on serving our community about our need for volunteers. And right now we are in a season where we are bulking up our volunteer team because we know uh, that we're heading into a season where we're going to need more volunteers. And so if you've been looking for a way to contribute, a way to get outside of just kind of your day-to-day life, but want to actually be contributing and serving in some way, uh, we've got so many ways you can serve. We can have you serve with our production team. Uh, So much of what we're doing right now is around production. If you want to be a part of the band, we're always looking for new people to help lead us in worship. Uh, So many different ways. Greeters, if you want to help us in following up with people, serving, meeting needs. Uh, We've got lots of ways for you to be involved. And so if you're looking for a way to serve, email us at church at brightcitychurch.com and we'll let you know how we can help you get involved. Lastly, we are so excited. Next Sunday, we're going to have an outdoor service. Sunday, July 19th, we're having an outdoor service. Cannot wait to get to be with many of you from our community that we just haven't been able to be with in a long time. And so we cannot wait to see you there next Sunday. We wanted to let you know, though, that we will not be streaming a service next Sunday morning. So uh, if you're not able to attend and not comfortable or in a, in a group of people that are high risk, um, we will be providing a video that will be out Monday evening, but we will not be streaming live that morning. So we want to give you a heads up on that. But we look forward to seeing many of you there next Sunday. So I don't know about you, but throughout the last four months, I have attended some really weird birthday parties. I think it was last month that we attended a birthday party for one of our son's classmates. This is one of his best friends from school, and he was turning seven. And the way that this all went down is we had to RSVP and reserve a time slot. And then we drove over there at our allotted time. We made posters, we had balloons, and we pulled up to their front yard, and Isaac's friend was standing in the yard, and we all yelled, and we all sang happy birthday. And then we got out and there was a giant poster that we could sign our name saying that we had had been there. And then the pen that we used to sign our names then became our party favor because we weren't going to be sharing pens with other people. And so this was this little boy's seventh birthday party. Our son Cohen, who is in preschool, had a similar birthday party with one of his classmates where we participated in a parade of driving by this little girl's house with with posters and with balloons. We have attended graduation parties that were like this, where we were in a parade of cars and we had posters and we had balloons and we shouted. Uh, A few weeks ago, I attended a baby shower for my sister-in-law, and it was hosted at my mother-in-law's house, except we did not go into her house. We had the baby shower in her driveway. And so under any other circumstance, these would be really terrible parties and just really confusing parties as well. But as you know, we are not under regular circumstances. We are in a pandemic. And so for that reason, we have been adjusting. A lot has been shut down. We can't go to the movies anymore. For a long time, we couldn't sit in restaurants. We couldn't travel. We couldn't go to playgrounds or parks. And so a lot has been stopped and a lot has been shut down. But one thing that we have not actually stopped doing, and this kind of struck me this week, is is it never never dawned on us that we would actually stop doing this, is we didn't actually stop celebrating. It wasn't as if we said, well, because of the pandemic, all birthdays are canceled now. It wasn't as if we said, because of the pandemic, 
all these graduates, these college graduates, these high school graduates, they're graduating, but we're, we are not going to acknowledge it at all. No, that would be silly. There was something deep inside all of us that seemed to acknowledge collectively that even though things have changed, even though we cannot celebrate the way that we used to celebrate, we will continue to celebrate. And it's something that we've almost kind of taken for granted. But I think there is a reason for that. And that is that God has put celebration into us and into his creation. He has woven it into his design. Now, this morning, we are concluding our series, Flourishing Under Quarantine. And we've been looking at spiritual practices that cultivate our faith no matter our circumstances. And so we've looked at daily devotion. We have looked at prayer. We have looked at generosity. Last week, I talked about faith and action and, and how important service is for cultivating your faith. And so this morning, we are going to conclude this series by looking at one more spiritual practice that actually cultivates your faith. And this is one that we probably never really think about as a spiritual practice, which is celebration. Now, to understand why celebration is actually a deeply spiritual practice, I want to go back to what I said just a moment ago, that this is something that God has put inside of us and that he has woven into creation. And so what I want to do this morning is actually zoom out a little bit. And this is something that I really, really love to do. We, we, we often think of the Bible as being kind of disjointed pieces. And I love zooming out and looking at what are actually the threads that God has woven throughout his word. And one of those threads is celebration. And so that's what we're going to be doing this morning. So we're going to start out in Genesis 1, the very, very beginning of the Bible with creation. This is one of the most familiar stories in the Bible that God creates the world in six days and then he rests on the seventh day. And so we pick up in Genesis 1 verse 31. And this is what it says. It says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good indeed. Evening came and then morning, the sixth day. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. So this is where we get our understanding of Sabbath. It was actually based upon the fact that God, the creator of the universe, worked for six days and then rested on the seventh. However, very often we look at the story and the way that we think of Sabbath is that it is simply abstaining from work, that you are just ceasing to work. And that is what we see happening here with God, but it's also more than that. What we also see here with him declaring that what he has just made is good is that it's not as if God creates for six days, and then lays down and takes a nap. What he is doing now is he is enjoying what he has just made. He is delighting in it. And this is a really important way to understand Sabbath as well, that Sabbath is not simply a day where we do nothing, but it is meant to be a day where we delight in God and we delight in the gifts of God. And so really what we see here at the very beginning of the Bible in Genesis 1 is the very first act of celebration. That part of creation is celebration. So this is at the very, very beginning of the Bible. And then we see that later on in the Old Testament where God creates this people, Israel, and this people are meant to reflect his character and reflect his will and to live his design. And so what they do is they take up this practice of Sabbath, where every seventh day they rest and they delight in God. And so this becomes an essential rhythm of the people of God. It's almost like an identity badge of the people of God, as these are the people of Sabbath. But they also don't stop there with the celebrating. As centuries go on with, with Israel, where they are following God through various eras, they begin incorporating other celebrations into their years as well. And by the time we get to Jesus, 
in the time that he is born, Jesus is a Jewish man who would have been raised according to the Jewish faith. By the time we get to Jesus, we have seven major feasts and festivals that are a part of the Jewish year. And so just to give you an overview of what these seven were, you had Passover, which is when the people of God remember being delivered out of slavery, out of Egypt. You have the Festival of Unleavened Bread, which is related to Passover. Uh, the Festival of First Fruits, offering of first fruits, which symbolized their gratitude and dependence on God. The Feast of Pentecost, which celebrated the end of the wheat harvest. The Feast of Trumpets, which is when an agricultural year had come to an end and a new one was beginning. The Day of Atonement, which was the one day of the year when a priest could enter the temple and make a sacrifice on behalf of the people to wipe away their sins from the previous year. And then finally, the Feast of Sukkot, which celebrated the fall harvest. And so these marked the Jewish year. It was marked by years and weeks of celebration. And so th this was the an annual and weekly rhythm of the people of God. And then Jesus is born into this, and he is raised up in this. And as we know, there are some things where Jesus came in, and he looked at you know, the Jewish faith and, and what had been done to it. And he said, this is not what God intended. This is not his design. But when it comes to celebration, Jesus actually did the opposite. He reinforced it. He reaffirmed it. And we see that in the overall arc of his ministry. So kicking off with Jesus's ministry in John 2, the very first miracle that Jesus does is at a wedding. So John 2, verses 1 through 11, it says, On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So if you think about it, this was a weird first miracle. You know, Jesus comes to earth. He is the son of God. He has the power of God for his first miracle, for his first demonstration of power. He can do anything. He can heal. He can feed the hungry. He can solve world peace. But what does Jesus do? Essentially, what seems like a party trick. He goes to a wedding and he turns water into wine. Why would Jesus do this? Well, one reason is that he is revealing an essential part of who he is, which is that God is not austere. God is not judgmental. God is not boring. God is not unfun. He is celebratory. He is delightful. He is quite literally the inventor of fun. And this is not an add-on to who he is, but this is actually essential to who God is. And so Jesus is revealing something about himself that we would consider to be non-essential. And by putting this at the very beginning of his ministry, he's saying, no, this is essential for understanding who I am. Now, fast forward to the end of Jesus's ministry, the Last Supper. Now, the Last Supper, a lot of people don't know, was actually a Passover meal, which, as I mentioned, was one of the many feasts, one of the many festivals that the Jewish people celebrated every year. 
And so we read about this in Matthew 26. It says, on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So that clarifies this, this last supper is a Passover meal. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So we tend to think of communion, whenever we take communion together, which is based on this passage here, this Last Supper, this Passover meal, we tend to think of it as a very somber occasion because this was right before Jesus died. And to some extent it is. But we miss out on the fact that the Passover meal was meant to be celebratory, that this was a time every year when the Jewish people came together and celebrated God's faithfulness to them. And so by celebrating this with his disciples, with his closest friends at the end of his life and saying, keep on doing this, keep on celebrating in this way, Jesus is essentially saying, when you take communion, it should not just be somber. This should be a celebration of when we remember that Jesus is our hope. We remember Jesus's victory over death. We remember what Jesus has done for us. And what we also see here, and Jesus makes reference to this in this passage just very, very subtly, but just as there was celebration at the beginning of the Bible, there is also celebration at the end in Revelation, where we have this language of this this marriage feast. And so celebration bookends the Gospels, it bookends Jesus's life and death, but it also bookends the Bible as well. So what are we to make of this? What does this mean for our lives? Well, first, this tells us what God is like. That God is not scary. God is not stingy. God is not judgmental. As I already said, God is definitely not boring. Instead, God is abundant. God is extravagant. God is actually fun. God is funny. God is joy. And so this is what we are being invited into as we draw closer to God. And it's what we're being invited into as we are made more like God. This is the vision. Second, what this means for us is that celebration is a spiritual discipline. For those of us who follow Jesus, who celebrated a lot, we also are to celebrate a lot. Now, that might sound weird to say that celebration is a discipline, that that takes something fun and then makes it inherently not fun. But it's important to remember that the word discipline, the root of it is disciple. And so all that it's saying is that if you consider yourself to be a disciple of Jesus, that this is how we follow him. And also that celebration is how we become like Christ which is really good news and very often not how we talk about following Christ. So what does that mean for us practically then? Well, first I wanna clarify two things that celebration is not. So celebration is not simply an escape from reality where we are simply trying to distract ourselves or numb ourselves. Instead, spiritual celebration, godly celebration is actually drawing our attention and focusing more so on God and the goodness of God. Second, celebration is not an excuse to simply do whatever you want. So think back to the wedding at Cana where Jesus turns the water into wine, but he does not proceed to then drink all the wine. And so celebration is not this excuse for just bad decision making. And it's important to be clear about what we're talking about here. So that said, what is the discipline of celebration? The discipline of celebration is actively remembering and enjoying the goodness of God in our lives. 
So it is actively remembering and enjoying another year of life, actively remembering and enjoying another year of marriage, actively remembering and enjoying another year of sobriety, actively remembering and enjoying another baby that is being born. And in each of these, we are celebrating the gift, but we are also remembering the giver. We are celebrating the generosity and faithfulness of God. So how do we live this out in our lives? When we look back at the Jewish people, they had rhythms of celebration. What could that look like for us? Well, I have three suggestions this morning. The first is to express gratitude daily. Gratitude really is the core of celebration. It is what we are doing whenever we celebrate. And this is a practice that we have been working on for the last year or two, actually, with our kids. Every night during prayers, we ask our boys to thank God for three things from that day. And for our oldest son, this this is a harder practice for him. He just, his personality orientation, we could be at Disney World, and he has trouble thinking of things that he's grateful for from that day. But our middle child, Cohen, is is kind of the opposite. He is grateful for everything. At night when we are saying prayers and I ask him to thank God for three things, he usually names 10. And he starts with mommy and daddy and Jesus, but then he starts going on about his friends at school. And then he kind of drifts into things like just the carpet. And he's really grateful for his lamp and he's really grateful for heart shapes. And one night he said he was really grateful for the letter W. And He one night was grateful that alligators look like dinosaurs. And so this is a boy who is really, really grateful and has been teaching me about gratitude as well. And that was something that I picked up actually when we went into quarantine and everything was shutting down and it felt like we were losing so much. And so during that time, I decided, you know what? I am going to post on Instagram every day three things that I am grateful for. And it became difficult very, very quickly. Like I I felt like I was running out of things to think of, but then it sort of flipped into having my eyes open to things that I had never been grateful for before. Like I'd never been that grateful for just having a yard. I'd never been that grateful for living on a cul-de-sac. I'd never been that grateful for just having walking trails in our neighborhood. And one thing I had not been that grateful for was toilet paper. But then there came a day when I would open up my closet and I saw a stack of toilet paper right there and I felt like I was Scrooge McDuck diving into a room of gold coins. I've never been so grateful for toilet paper. And so this actually transformed me, this this practice of, of daily gratitude. There's this saying that comparison is the thief of joy. But daily gratitude, it it accomplishes the opposite of that. When we intentionally look for things to thank God for, it cultivates joy in our hearts. So that is the first practice of celebration, the first practical way we can practice celebration. The second is to celebrate weekly. So going back to this idea of, of Sabbath, of weekly Sabbath, and how we tend to think of it simply as a boring day where we just sit and do nothing. And if you tuned in back a couple months ago now when Jeff Bethke preached, he had talked about thinking of Sabbath more the way you think of it as a holiday, where this is a day where you cease from working, you cease from production, but you cease in order to enjoy God and to enjoy the gifts of God. And so this is a weekly practice of ours, a weekly celebration. And I'd love for you to just reframe Sabbath that way. And then the final way that we can practice celebration might sound a little bit unspiritual, a little bit strange, but I think it's important, which is to laugh often. To laugh often. We don't think of laughter necessarily as a spiritual practice, but when you really pause to reflect on it, Laughter is this most basic human reflex to joy, this basic human response to joy. Not just something that is funny, but really to joy. I will never forget when Sadie was born. She's our first girl, our first and only girl. And we knew we were having a girl. It wasn't a surprise. But I will never forget the moment 
when she was born and the doctors held up this, this little baby and said, it's a girl. And my response was to laugh. It's not that it was funny, but I was so overcome with joy. Laughter is our most basic human response to joy. And it, I, I would argue that it's also our most transcendent response to joy. It's almost like every time you laugh, this tiny celebration is happening in your body and your soul for just a moment. Seriousness, on the other hand, it does not coincide quite as well with celebration. And so I want to reframe laughter, and, and I'm not talking about mean laughter, I'm not talking about sarcastic laughter, but the kind of laughter that is pure delight, pure holy delight as an act of nurturing your soul. And so I want to encourage you to take those opportunities to laugh often. And so to close this morning, my challenge to you as we continue on in this pandemic is that one of the ways we will flourish is to continue celebrating. And we're already doing it. It's, it's clearly written into us. We're already doing it. But to know that when you're doing it, that this is not a shallow distraction, but that it has been put in us by God and that it is actually how we become like God. And so right now, in a moment, we are going to take communion together as an act of celebration. And so I'm going to go ahead and I invite Ike to come up and preside over communion for us. But I also wanted to mention that just another weekly celebration opportunity is going to be next Sunday when we gather together outside to worship. That this is going to be a really beautiful moment of celebration for us as a church. Thank you, Sharon. One of the beautiful things about communion is that in many traditions, uh, they refer to it as Eucharist, which means to give thanks or, or thanksgiving. And in uh, liturgical context, uh, the, the liturgy to do communion is actually called the great thanksgiving. And the one who, who oversees communion is called the celebrant. And so there's very much this sense that communion is about celebration. It's about giving thanks. It's about gratitude. It's about being grateful. And so we're going to take some time this morning and uh, just give some space for us to celebrate together communion. Uh, and so I want you to take a moment and just prepare your heart, prepare your mind for us to celebrate this together. And then I will lead us as we enter into this time. One of the things that Sharon discussed in her message was how celebration was not something that you waited until everything was okay to go and then celebrate at that point. And when we look at Jesus and we look at this last night before he is betrayed, uh, it doesn't seem like a moment to celebrate. It doesn't seem like a moment to come together and to give thanks. And yet that's exactly what we see Jesus doing with his disciples is coming together with them. Uh, and in the midst of all that's going on, celebrating in anticipation of what God is going to do. And so on the night that Jesus was betrayed, uh, we see that Jesus took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples. And he said this, he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so I want to invite you with your family, with your friends uh, to take a moment to, to break bread to take the bread, to eat it, and to reflect in this moment on not only Christ's death, but his resurrection and what we get to celebrate as a part of what he accomplished for us. After supper, it says he took the cup of wine and he looked at his disciples and said, this is the cup of the new covenant. This represents my blood, which will be shed for you. Drink ye all of it. And so I want to invite you now to take a moment, take a moment with those who are around you, take the cup and to drink. And as you do, be reminded of the new covenant that we have in Christ and what a celebration 
It should be every time that we come together as a community of God's people who celebrate what was accomplished for us, for the world, for our relationships with one another, and most of all, our relationship with God. I want to close this celebration of communion with these words from the great Thanksgiving liturgy. It's a prayer. It says this, it says, Father, we now celebrate the memorial of your son. By means of this holy bread and cup, we show forth the sacrifice of his death and proclaim his resurrection until he comes again. Gather us by this holy communion into one body in your son, Jesus Christ. Make us a living sacrifice of praise. By him and with him and in him and in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. This last song we're going to sing this morning is probably a song that's not familiar to you, but it's very easy to pick up and to sing. It's called Be Our Guide. It's simply a prayer saying, God, guide us along the ways of life. You are trustworthy. You've proven yourself faithful through the ages. And we love you. And we want to follow you and sing praises to your name as we follow you. So let's sing this together. It goes like this.
He's with you now. He will be with you this week. He will be with you every step of your life. So, Lord, we pray that your love, your faithfulness will envelop us and enwrap us and enfold us in a new way this week as your church walks with you, as you walk with your church. We love you, Lord. We thank you for this time of worship. Go with us now with your peace and your joy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.